The worsening insecurity in the country engaged the attention of the National Assembly, with the Senate urging President Muhammad Buhari to direct the National Security Advisor, Major General Babagana Mungono, retired the service chiefs and the Inspector General of Police, Mr. Muhammad Adamu, to rejig the nation's security architecture to tackle the security challenges facing the country. Also, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Wajabiamila, has admitted that the government has failed in its primary responsibility of protecting the lives and property of every Nigerian. And joining us to have this conversation is political commentator Adeni Yukunu and broadcast journalist Belo Sani. Uh, but we're, uh, we have Adeni Yukunu joining us right now. Good evening, Adeni, and thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. I say good evening to uh, the viewers out there. Thank you. So I'm going to start um, with the National Assembly and the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, you know, they say the best time to plant a tree or do a thing was yesterday. Well, the next best, best time is today. Uh, in the case of the House of Representatives, uh, May, uh, do you think they came late to the party uh, talking about the issue of insecurity and, and realizing that, you know, they, there's been a failure of the state in dealing with the issue of insecurity? Why do you think that the level of insecurity in the country has deteriorated to this point? Well, if I don't say that posterity will not forgive me, uh, Maria, the reality is we are in a state of anarchy in Nigeria. Uh, today is the 11th day of February 2021, and Nigeria is basking in all of the negatives of, of insecurity. The reason I've said that is very simple. The nation has been battling with Boko Haram since 2009. Um, Sharia came to the north in 1999. Uh, if you look at what is happening across the country, it is not something that um, just, you know, started happening overnight. There are a lot of antecedents that have built up to this point that we have deliberately ignored, uh, which in fact is biting us uh, down our ankles. Why have I said that? In the history of this country, I've never seen a situation where you are talking about a religious cleric who found it very comfortable to go to where um, bandits are, held a meeting with them, and they felt like they were gods, trying to pardon people. When you're talking about one of the things that happened when Sheikh Gumi preceded this bandit, it's a pointer to many facts that we are not ready to face and talk about. Why have I said that? Time and again, the DSS and, of course, um, the Nigerian army will say they would appreciate that people come forward with information to help them overcome banditry and insurgency. Before a Sheikh Gumi would hold a meeting with bandits in the forest, or particularly in Shinkafi local government area where the meeting held, there must have been some kind of interaction among him and many other persons. But the reality was Sheikh Gumi did not come forward to help the DSS or the Nigerian army. Rather, he held a meeting. I therefore want to ask, in what capacity has Sheikh Gumi met with the insurgent, having not provided information to the security operatives before going to meet with them? And later on, he started advocating that they give those that have killed people raped people, maimed lives, certain reprieves, and was referring to the Niger Delta militants. I think that if we want to solve the security situation of this country, we well, first of all must uproot every form of hypocrisy, the untruths, and the disaffection that is going by the number. So Nigeria is in a state of anarchy now, because if you look at what this administration did, the first one year plus that it came to power, especially how it dealt with the insurgency in the Northeast, it seems as if things have come to a level where certain persons are comfortable relating with bandits. And if you check, Shegumi did not hold one meeting, he held two meetings. 
We're talking insecurity. That particular thing is significant. Whatever the lawmakers say, I'll describe it as airy platitudes because time and again we've said that. But Javi Amina has spoken, Padme Lawan has spoken. But I think that what is very, very important is to look at the area. Don't be distracted by what the lawmakers are saying. Pay attention to the fact that a religious cleric has held two successful meetings. First, he held a meeting with 150 fully armed bandits. The second meeting, 600 bandits had meeting with Shegumi. And if you check the video and the picture, you see sophisticated weaponry. So if the DSS is asking questions and you know soliciting support so that they can deal with insurgency, the first person they are supposed to invite is Shegumi to come and help them understand how he was able to broker such a very important meeting with bandits, how he went over to that place and he met with them, and at the moment is now advocating that government do some form of thing for them that they did for themselves. So I have to tell you, Nigeria is in a state of anarchy, Maria. Uh, I don't know if, we, if I can really totally agree with you when it comes to the word anarchy here, because you, I guess you're using it loosely. But um, there's been a lot of talk over the years and months. In fact, the, the, the thing that became a sing-song amongst us all was the cry for service chiefs to be changed, being that maybe that could help change the situation of things. And then, boom, the service chiefs have been changed. Um, and now we're talking about rejigging the structure. Other than this talk, other than you saying, I mean, because you made a statement about us being sentimental about the issue. In fact, we have gone beyond being sentimental. There is being a lot of politicizing of this issue. How can we break through all of this to get to the nitty gritty, which is action? We have so many um, boots on the ground in the North Central, in the Northeast. We have so many soldiers, we have JTFs, why, I asked this question to an, uh, uh, um, a Northern chieftain who was on the show some weeks ago, how come one person is able to get through to these bandits, but we have so many soldiers, so many boots on the ground, and we've not been able to catch these people and deal decisively with them. Why is it taking so long? All right, let's look at this. I'd like to go to what the lawmakers said, when they said that fourth we would like to uh, legislate in such a way that the legislation they put forward with what can actually arrest the situation and help engage youth so that they don't go into crimes. Marianne, there is a lot of hypocrisy and lies within the political circle. And you cannot deal with any problem when you find out that the lies continue to becloud the sense of reasoning of people. I have personally said some things to those who care to listen. That when you are talking, for instance, about the removal of the service chiefs, I said I am not excited because at the initial, the service chief issue did not only, you know, uh, result in some kind of raucous uproar regarding the removal of the former one. The reality was the president had to choose virtually all the service chiefs from a segment of the country. Don't forget that that's the first argument. The second concern was the fact that the service chiefs seem to have lost strategy, they have lost this, they should be doing for retirement. Now they took them out. To check the service chiefs that were recently appointed, and what happened after the announcement of those that have just assumed office, you'd agree with me that it's also a bungle process. If you check most news stories now, we find out that the lawmakers will now be screening those who have assumed office. You don't screen people that have assumed office. You screen people to actually be able to make recommendations about their capacity to occupy an office or not. So the current service chiefs themselves are people who are in that office, and their presence has caused a lot of disaffection, not because they are incompetent, but because the executive arm of government bungled the procedure of getting them in. For instance, as I've said this, there may be some excuses in certain quarters that Adeni Yukunu doesn't he know that the lawmakers were on recess. Well, that should have been a couple of weeks. But it, from is, now is it, for the I, 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 I mean, again, is it just a, an issue of the service chiefs? Because I mean, we, what service chiefs or no service chiefs? No, 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 no. We, we have 
a matter of life and death. We have people dropping dead every other day. Uh, people are being harassed, people are being tortured. People do not feel safe in their domain. And we're talking, we're having a cozy conversation about service chiefs. Is that really the thing? And then you talked about legislation. We have so many laws in this country, so many orders, uh, both executive, I mean, we have so many of them. But we're talking about the willpower, the, the ability to deal with this issue of insecurity that has now become a hydra-headed monster of sorts with different names. So let, let's say this, for instance. The North, for instance, created Sharia, right? Mm -hmm. Because they felt it was going to actually engender the kind of leadership, the kind of oneness that they want. But certain fundamentals are very necessary in keeping the peace and security of any society. Islamic society, um, Christian society, and that is responsible leadership. If you check the poverty rate of, for instance, Kano, the poverty rate of most of the states that are practicing Sharia law is even higher than the people who are not practicing Sharia law. It therefore means that the intention of Sharia, which is supposed to enhance proper leadership, has not been rightly deployed by the people. And another question is, it's a secular state. So why I've gone there is, if you look at all the states that have refused to, for instance, have the Child's Right Act, have been able, have not adopted it, they are the ones that are giving Nigeria a lot of security problems. And why is that? If you check the Fourth Republic in the past 21 years, a lot of people have not been given the opportunity to be educated, they have not been given the opportunity to be integrated into the current system of things. They have not been helped to a great extent. I'm not saying maybe previous governments have not done anything. But what I am saying is the level of attention that should have been given to ensuring that people get education, to ensure that the girl child is protected and given priority, it is the same people that are not allowing it to happen, so, and they are breeding an army of insurgents and bandits. So, Adeni, Adeni you're telling me, obviously, you are suddenly re echoing what um, Femi Badabi Amila, the speaker, has said that we, that they, the government, have failed Nigeria in terms of security. Oh, Should we, so, so, so going forward, I'm out of time. So, going forward, are we supposed to fold our arms and just wait and watch more and more people or dead bodies drop because our governments have failed? What about the willpower going forward? How do we deal with this? Is it that our, our security forces are overwhelmed? Are they bereft of ideas? What exactly can we really hold on to going okay. forward? Because people need some, some form of hope to be certain that they can be safe within their mother or their fatherland. Let me be very generous with you. One of the challenges Nigeria has now, apart from the fact that we have less than the numbers needed to manage the, the population of over 200 million, is the fact that the modus operandi of our security forces is also not helping our situation. Let me create a picture here. You will actually give employment to somebody who is to become a police officer, and the person is, for instance, 25 or 30 years, you now deploy that person to a place like Bielsa, especially at the creeks. And this person has not seen that kind of terrain before. That police officer has not seen the kind of, you know, the, the, the culture shock and the rest of it all. Now, the psychology of the police officer the enthusiasm of the police officer, in fact, the interest of the police officer, everything was dies simply because you have not posted the right person to work in the right places. And that is why we have to first of all look at the way we operate our security network in the country. In the first place, you don't employ people because you want to employ those who don't have jobs. So at certain time, they do recruitment. They will make an announcement. And you see people who are trying to get into the police are those first who do not have jobs, not those who are actually interested in helping to deal with security problems. One of the things that can help us battle effectively all of this problem is to sit at a table and say, we cannot continue to operate the kind of security we operate here where you have recruitment 
of people based on their need for a job rather than their interest and their expertise in fighting, you know, security in fighting security challenges. And in closing, here, in closing, we have to go. Yes. In closing. Uh, in closing now, I think that Nigeria has come to a state where we have to say it as it is. Government must try as much as possible. For instance, I'm going to talk about briefly as I, as, as I leave your studio, the National Livestock Transformation Plan. Government cannot be saying that it wants to effectively deal with insecurity issues and government is going to actually breed another level of insecurity by making provisions for people who are private businesses, knowing full well that the land for the livestock transformation plan belong to a people that actually perhaps are farmers, are businessmen, are industrialists. So I think that government should try as much as possible to put its own feet on the break of the national livestock transformation because that is at the center of this conversation. Okay. So let government understand that even the entire north, for instance, has more land space. So there are certain parts of the north that has a lot of green spaces they can do, you know, leverage irrigation and technology and farming to All right. actually deal with this issue. Well, I we have to go. We'll be able to actually explain this thing. Yeah. Adini Kunu is a political commentator. Thank you very much for speaking with us on this topic. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you for the privilege of talking to my friends. Thank you very much. All right. Well, Thank we'll you. take a short break now. And when we come back, I'll give you my take. Here's my take. In a bid to free Nigeria of insecurity, of banditry, kidnapping, raping, and killing of people in the name of farmer or header clashes, we have had to entertain all sorts. There have been calls for negotiations with bandits. Now they're asking for amnesty. Is this really what needs to be done? Is this what we should resort to, rewarding bad behavior and bloodletting? I mean, I've said it before on this show, and time and time again, and I'll say it again, when leadership isn't alive to its responsibility, there's bound to be chaos. When people pay more lip service to security issues than actually securing the nation, this is what we get. For all those asking for amnesty for bandits, what happens to the family of those rice farmers killed helplessly on their rice farms? Or those who were killed and slaughtered in their sleep in Kaduna? And the many others that we cannot even mention, Continuous and serious pressure is what we need to be mounted on our government and security agencies to deal with the level of insecurity that we face today and leave no stones unturned because without safety and security, there cannot be any development in Nigeria. I am Mariana Kong, thanking you for watching.